Part 3, Keep an Open Mind to the World Having trained the mind to focus inwardly, we can then turn our attention outward to how we interact with others. One of those interactions is gratitude, which arises as you recognize that something is valuable to you, which has nothing to do with its monetary worth. Gratitude promotes a healthier mind by limiting the possible physical harm originating from emotional upset. With gratitude comes better relationships and greater life satisfaction. It enhances our self-esteem and proves that we are worthy of love. So, how can we strengthen awareness of gratitude in our daily lives? Well, think about how many wonderful things in life we receive through luck or others' good intentions rather than from our own efforts. Maybe you are fortunate enough to have been born into a wealthy family, have loving parents, or have other kind lovers. Think about how you have been blessed with many life opportunities. Think about the good things in life, like the uplifting fresh air and the sunshine, loving your family and friends, or simply anticipating a delicious cup of coffee. Follow these exercises from time to time and make gratitude a part of your life. With such benevolent thoughts in mind, Shetty goes on to remind us to always be grateful, even when life isn't perfect. When things go wrong, think about what you can learn from the situation or of other different possible opportunities for growth. If we can train a grateful heart, like a muscle, it will strengthen over time. Having cultivated our inner gratitude, let's spread gratitude outward toward others. The most basic way to express gratitude is to say thank you. However, you should try to be as specific as possible about what you're thanking for. For example, you can say, thanks for last night, the food was wonderful. And, I loved the funny, sweet toast you made when we raised our glasses for your friend. The more specific and authentic the expression, the better it will be received by others. Gratitude should be expressed in person as much as possible. When this isn't possible, you can always write a note, send a text, or call specifically to express your thanks. The result of making such an effort will be mutually satisfying. Sometimes it can be difficult to express gratitude to important people in our lives, such as members of our family, close friends, and respected mentors. For this reason, remember, even if the other person seems above your appreciation, don't give up on thanking them. One reason why it might seem difficult to express thanks to certain people may be because no one wants to be put in an embarrassing situation. Once you recognize this concern, you could adapt the way you express your gratitude to make it more comfortable for the other person. A written message is one of the easiest ways. It gives you time to compose your thoughts and the other party time and space to process your expression of gratitude. When writing such a letter, try to give the other person a sense that you care and love what they have done for you. You can tell them how you felt when they were helping you. Moreover, a thank you letter is a lasting expression of appreciation for another person's efforts. It will deepen your bond more than a quick verbal expression of thanks. It is often even more challenging to express gratitude to people who have hurt us. However, gratitude does not come in a single black or white package. While we don't have to be appreciative of someone's actions as a whole, we can learn to recognize and express our grateful thanks for the best of their efforts. Everything we have discussed thus far, whether it be getting rid of external influences or exercising the mind, relates to the topic of how to live a full and meaningful life. However, Shetty believes that the highest purpose of existence is service. As monks live in service, to think like a monk requires us to understand the concept of service. Monks believe that service can make all lives better. Serving others can banish any sense of loneliness because it makes us feel needed. Service heightens our compassion and gives us a feeling of meaning and purpose. Scientific research has also found that giving to others activates pleasure centers in our brains, reducing anxiety and depression. Service actually helps us to live longer, be healthier, and have happier lives. Some people may feel that they have the heart to serve others, but because they lack time and financial resources, they choose to defer engaging in service. They wait for an optimal opportunity. But when is the right time to serve? Keep in mind that we may never be fully satisfied. We may never have too much time on our hands or too much money. In fact, the poor are often more eager to donate money than the rich. A 2011 survey of charitable giving showed that in the U.S., people with the lowest incomes donated an average of 3% of their wages to charity, while the rich gave just 1%. We can only shift to a service mentality if we relinquish our attachments to money and time. 
Another question may arise, how do I serve? Do I need a plan? Do I leave my current job and set aside more time? To which Shetty's answer is no. He firmly believes that if you want to serve, you should just do it. When you see fundraising events at your school, you can join the collecting. If a relative is sick and has to stay at home, go visit them. If you go to a restaurant to eat, you can pack the leftovers to share with the poor and homeless. Opportunities for service can be found everywhere and show up in many ways. You don't have to be charitable every day. Think of everything you do in terms of love and responsibility. Try to connect what you do in your life to a higher purpose. We have now reached the end of the third and final part of this bookie. We have learned that we must strive to be grateful, serve others, and view the world with an open mind. Hi, welcome to Bookie. Today we will unlock the book Think Like a Monk, Train Your Mind for Peace and Purpose Every Day. But why should you think like a monk? Well, if you want to learn how to play basketball, you would probably want to train with Michael Jordan. Or, if you're trying to get in touch with your creative side, Elon Musk is your man. What if you want to learn how to put on an unforgettable performance? Beyonce can definitely give you some pointers there. Now, if you're looking to train your mind to find peace, serenity, and purpose, then learning from a monk would be an excellent place to start. Why is that, you say? Let's begin by exploring Jay Shetty's own experience. At the age of 18, Shetty was a freshman at the Cass Business School in London. A friend of Shetty's asked him to hear a monk give a lecture, but Shetty was skeptical and turned down the invitation. At this time in his life, Shetty was only interested in people who made their own opportunities and their success stories. Despite Shetty's reluctance, finally, his friend convinced him to go to the lecture. Later, Shetty described the experience as feeling like he fell in love. Goranga Das was the monk's name. He was in his mid-thirties, an Indian who had dropped out of the Indian Institute of Technology, regarded as India's MIT. He had given up the very life many people desperately strive for. Yet, he appeared happy, happier than other people enjoying high prestige, status, or good looks. Monks like Das claim to enjoy elevated mental states, and science backs them up. In a study of the Buddhist monk Machu Ricard's brain, researchers found that the level of his gamma waves, which are associated with attention, memory, learning, and happiness, was the highest they had ever observed. He became known as the world's happiest man brain scans of 21 other meditating monks similarly revealed enhanced brain activity associated with these functions. Even after meditation, it was considerably elevated and sustained compared to a control group of subjects who did not meditate. Like many people, Shetty's goal in life was to get married and earn a fortune. It was not until he heard Das' speech that he found his true path. He is determined to explore new ideas and ways of living, practicing humility, compassion, empathy, and other altruistic qualities. After several twists and turns in his life, finally, he joined a monastery and became a monk. According to Shetty, if he can learn to think like a monk, anyone can. If you cannot or would rather not join a monastery, at least not right now, you can always begin your journey by reading this book. In it, Shetty shares what he has learned in his life. If you take his advice seriously and put it into practice, you will find meaning, truth, passion, and purpose in your life. We will all learn how to follow his example through the following three parts. Part 1. Avoid external and internal influences. Part 2. Reshape your life to achieve growth. Part 3. Keep an open mind to the world. Part 1. Avoid external and internal influences. Throughout our lives, we are subjected to various external pressures. Family, friends, society, and the media dictate what type of person we should strive to be and what we should do with our lives. After high school, for instance, you're told you need to attend a prestigious college so that you can acquire a good job after graduation. Then comes marriage, buying a house, having children, and hopefully getting promoted in your work. There is nothing inherently wrong with these life choices. However, if you determine that these are your goals in life arbitrarily, you may end up feeling unfulfilled at your work, unhappy with your home, 
or even unsure about your relationship with your spouse. Consequently, you'll wonder when doubts set in. Where did these misgivings come from? Shetty points out that if you want a meaningful life, it's crucial to filter out the noise first and rethink priorities, deciding what's the most important to you. In the book, Shetty explains that it would be hard for us to address our thoughts and explore our minds when we are preoccupied. So, in order to figure out what's truly important to us, we need to create a space for self-flexion. Shetty proposes three proactive strategies for this end. The first suggestion is to take some time every day to consider how you spent your time and how it made you feel. Each month, you might also visit somewhere different, an unfamiliar place where you can explore yourself. It could be a park or a library. A third option is simply doing something you find meaningful, like pursuing your hobby. Another way to understand what you really need is to look at how you use your time and existing environment. When you are not working and sleeping, what are you doing? Or what do you want to do? Do you devote this spare time to your family, friends, health, or for yourself? How you invest your time will reflect the value that has a role to play in your life. Similarly, how you spend your money can also help you understand your core values and what truly motivates your life. After paying for the necessities of food, housing, cars, and paying back any money you owe, where do you spend the money left over? Is this consumption aligned with what matters to you most? By such self-analysis, you will ascertain the values that have become important in your life. The next step is to make a map of these values. Monks believe that values can be divided into two groups, higher values and lower values. The higher values lead toward happiness, fulfillment, and meaning. Lower values can push us toward anxiety, depression, and suffering. We need to let go of false, irrelevant values that fill up the space in our lives. Family members, colleagues, or friends who possess qualities we admire can also provide lessons, and we can actively learn from them. Their qualities harmonize with our values, and we can aim for them to guide our lives. If you're unsure whether someone fits in with your values, you can try asking yourself this. When you are with them, do you feel like you're getting closer or farther from the type of person you want to become? From this insight, you can choose to grow alongside the people that you feel comfortable being around. As long as we identify personal values and live according to them, we can effectively filter out external influences. Next, let's look at the ways to deal with our internal influences, the negativity. Almost every day, we face some form of negativity, from getting up in the morning with messy hair to missing the green light on the way to work and blaming other drivers for being slow off the mark. Even when you finally arrive at work, it's only to learn that a colleague is absent, probably pretending to be sick again. It's no wonder that we have a tendency to spread our negativity to others. We may complain to our partners, speak ill of friends behind their backs, or adopt the role of a keyboard warrior on social media. Even on what might seem to be a perfect day, negativity can creep into your life. According to Shetty, negativity is an internal force, even though no one would wake up in the morning and start thinking, how can I harbor more negative emotions today? Negative emotions most likely arise when our three core emotional needs, peace, love, and understanding, are threatened. For example, when we are afraid that bad things may happen to us, we experience the loss of peace. Similarly, if we do not receive the affection we crave, our need for love is unrequited. When we are not treated with the respect we deserve, we are left feeling misunderstood. Each of these unfulfilled emotional needs leads to all kinds of negative emotions, including fear, insecurity, hurt feelings, and confusion. Such negative emotions can take the form of complaints, disparaging comparisons, and critiques. For instance, trolls venting their malicious intent on social media may resort to cyberbullying to have a feeling of accomplishment out of fear of being belittled. It is no doubt that at least once in their lives, everyone has the experience of being a victim. However, indulging ourselves in negativity has more adverse and sometimes even permanent impacts. To start with, having a victim mentality can lead to a sense of entitlement and provoke selfish behavior. Moreover, complaining about misfortunes does not diffuse anger. 
Even people who feel relief after venting their frustrations tend to be more aggressive than those who don't vent in the first place. This is because complaining is stressful. It produces cortisol, a stress hormone, which damages the areas of the brain that are related to reasoning and memory. It can also weaken the immune system, making people more susceptible to infections and falling ill. To cope with our inner negativity, Shetty proposes a method used by monks that he refers to as spot, stop, and swap. Many people are oblivious to their negative emotions, and that's why Shetty encourages us to start by spotting them. To spot involves growing sensitivity and becoming more aware of feelings or troubles. Recording negative thoughts and remarks can help identify where they originate and reveal whether we are as critical of ourselves as we may be towards others. When you begin to understand your negative emotions, the next step, stop, requires you to curb your negative talk. We might be aware that, by doing this, we have less to talk about. Holding back might even make us feel a little depressed at first. Nonetheless, it's vital to remember that moaning and complaining do nothing to better our situation. So, this process is well worth it. Then we can come to the last step, swap. Having restrained our negative behaviors we replace them with a new approach. We can express our negative emotions in more specific and less extreme language. We can say we feel annoyed or offended instead of simply angry. Being mindful of our words can make us more cognizant of our negativity. Also, instead of complaining, we can opt for a more positive communicative approach. For example, rather than whining to our friends about our partner coming home late, we can communicate with them directly. We can also swap the negative emotions we might experience with positivity. Instead of being envious of someone else's success, share in their happiness. Monks refer to the unselfish rejoicing in the success of others as midito. While the material world is competitive, convincing us that our chances of success and happiness are limited and that what others gain means fewer opportunities for ourselves, monks believe that everyone has a seat in the theatre of happiness. In other words, anyone who wants to participate in Midito is welcome to watch the show, and they don't need to worry about missing out on universal gladness and joy. Another way to calm our mind is to distance ourselves from other negative sources, be it the environment or people. Negativity is contagious. If we're surrounded by gossip, conflict, and bad feelings, we start to see the world in a similar way, as a dark place. Shetty also gives some suggestions on this aspect. The first way is to be an objective observer. Try to step back from the emotional entanglement of the moment and look at the situation from the outside. From this standpoint, we can back away slowly and avoid the things that can trigger negative thoughts and feelings. While it might not be easy to distance ourselves from the negative people around us, we can try adopting the 25-75ths principle. This proposes that for every negative person we encounter in our surroundings, we should dilute them with three positive people. Of course, this doesn't require giving everyone around you a definitive label. Instead, it's about making yourself feel like you're spending at least 75% of your time with people on the positive side. As for negative people that cannot be avoided, adjust the time you allot to them. Don't let them sap your energy to the extent that you can't tolerate them. And, finally, don't think of yourself as anyone's saviour. If you blindly help others regardless of whether they really need your help, even if you have the ability to offer them the necessary support, it will only bring you frustration. Now that we've discussed negativity, let's shift our focus to fear. As Buddha puts it, fear does not prevent death. It prevents life. It can be alarming to address conflict and uncertainty in economic, social, and political spheres and just as much worrying in interpersonal environments. Fear blocks our true feelings. It holds us back, and in our bodies, over time, it ferments into toxins. However, fear isn't necessarily a bad thing. Fear is a valuable warning, a sign that something undesirable is likely to happen. As such, when we stop seeing fear as a negative factor, we can switch our relationship with it. Our first step should be to accept our fear because if we want to eliminate it, its existence must be acknowledged. To do this, we should sit calmly, take a deep breath, and whisper to our fear, I see you. 
In doing so, we're giving it the attention it needs, just as a crying baby needs to be heard and comforted. Breathing calmly while acknowledging our fears helps calm the mind and body. It allows us to make informed decisions. In addition to accepting fear, we must also learn to face it. To do this, we must identify the circumstances in which it occurs most frequently. We must speak to our fear with kindness and sincerity, asking, when do I feel you? During his stay at the monastery, Shetty recalled situations that engendered fear, such as when he was worried about exams, performance at school, and his parents' opinions. He found that these fears had a common theme, all pointed to a single issue. He was worried about how others saw him. The fear had affected his decision-making. As a result, in the future, whenever Shetty had to make an important decision, he considered whether his thinking was influenced by other people's opinions. By adopting this principle, he found that he made better decisions aligned with his true values. The ultimate way to address and alleviate fear is to practice detachment. To be detached means to look at one's reactions from the outside. It enables one to make clear decisions with an uncluttered mind. Only when Shetty realized that he was constantly distracted by worries of disappointing his parents did he free himself from this anxiety. He became aware that he must take responsibility for his own life. Whether or not his parents would be disappointed by his decisions was beyond his control. He should only act according to independent values. It is worth noting that detachment does not imply apathy, nor does it prevent us from enjoying and engaging with life. Detachment is more like staying in a beautiful guesthouse when you're on vacation. You don't spend the entire vacation worrying that you will soon have to leave. If we can regard our life as a guesthouse, we won't have the problem enjoying the rest of our lives freely and won't live in constant fear that our feeling of contentment will evaporate when it's time to leave. We are all lucky vacationers enjoying our stay in Hotel Earth. That concludes the first part. We have discussed becoming aware and letting go of the distraction and negativity that distance ourselves from living a fulfilling life. Next, we will look at how to reshape our lives around our core values. Part 2 – Reshape Your Life to Achieve Growth Shetty points out that growth begins with Dharma. This concept can't be defined by one or two English words, and according to Shetty, the closest expression is your calling. It's about using our passions and skills to do something that matters to the world. It is through these processes that we will gain fulfillment. An equation can be used to express this as follows, passion plus expertise plus usefulness equals dharma. When living in dharma is our life's aim, work satisfaction comes from the work itself and how it benefits others rather than from gaining individual recognition and praise. So, how do we find our dharma? To begin with, we need to discover our passions or the things we are good at and love to do. The problem is that life doesn't always play out as expected. Oftentimes, what we love and what we are good at do not always overlap with each other. Many people end up doing a job they are good at but do not enjoy because it's lucrative, and later immerse themselves in what they love in their spare time, although they don't really have enough time to practice and perfect those skills. The dilemma raises the question, how do we find things that match our skills and give us pleasure when we do them? If we are not definite about our natural preferences and predilections, we can gain insight into what we like and what we are good at by understanding our varna. Varnas refer to four personality types, the creator, the maker, the guide, and the leader. Creators excel at brainstorming, interpersonal communication, and innovation. For this reason, they will thrive in positions like marketers, entertainers, or entrepreneurs. Makers' proficiency is in inventing, supporting, and implementing. It makes them excellently suited for social work, medicine, engineering, and programming. Guides, on the other hand, excel at learning, researching, and sharing knowledge. They are generally teachers, guides, coaches, and mentors. Last but not least, leaders have the ability to govern, inspire, and deliver change, meaning they are often found in the military, judiciary, law enforcement, and political spheres. Birth doesn't determine one's varna, and none of the four varnas is better or worse than the other. They just help us to understand ourselves and will aid us in achieving our dharma. 
After finding and understanding our Vana, we need to test it in our daily lives. Suppose your Vana is the leader, try adopting that role at work or in life. Ask yourself whether you enjoy being in that position. When monks complete an activity or one of the mental disciplines mentioned in the book, they exercise their mindfulness by questioning their experiences. They might ask, what did I like about it? Was I good at it? Do I want to take the time to master it? Am I motivated to improve? What made me feel comfortable or uncomfortable? If I felt uncomfortable, was it in a challenging way that made me grow? In this way, the monks gain a more nuanced perspective on their growth. Aside from being attentive to our thoughts and mental functions to determine if an activity works for us, we can also monitor our physical responses. When in our dharma, we should feel alive and at ease. Simultaneously we should be progressing with a timeless flow. Also, we should be capable of summoning these sensations repeatedly and allowing them to guide our ongoing discipline and continuous growth. Our next topic is how to make life meaningful. To do this, we must live in the moment. Anyone can practice mindfulness during their daily routine through activities such as noting the existence of a particular rock that they walk past every day, feeling their body's rhythm when exercising, or savoring each and every bite of food they eat. In short, not taking things for granted. You can also try changing things up to awaken your senses to the things you might usually overlook. Try to rearrange the clutter on your desk, switch the light bulbs in your home to lights of different intensities, or flip the mattress you sleep on over onto the other side. To take mindfulness a step further, we need to understand and appreciate the benefit that routine has to offer. Building a routine suggests we do certain things at certain places and certain times, which is conducive to living in the moment, just as many people study better in libraries and work better in offices. To establish a routine, we need to first raise our environmental awareness. Through each ordinary day, we go to a wide range of environments without contemplating their importance, but it's now time to pause and carefully consider which environments we enjoy being in. Do you prefer social activity or solitude? Do you like a cozy corner or an expansive open plan space? Extravagance or simplicity? Understand where you like to be and where you will thrive and spend as much time there as possible. The reason why routines matter is that space has its energy. When the space has a dedicated purpose and isn't multifunctional, its energy can not only help us focus and fulfill our dharma, but also improve our moods and increase our work efficiency. On the contrary, when you watch TV dramas or eat in your bedroom, you disrupt that space's energy. Such disruption and dilution of the bedroom energy, for example, might make it hard for you to rest there. That is why we should choose different places for different activities. This also applies to time allocation. If we do the same thing at the same time every day, we invest ourselves more in the activity and remember to do it. Such a routine also helps us to get better at it. If you want to train in the gym, go there every morning or always in the evening, not today in the morning and tomorrow at night. Fixed time and regular places help maximize the sense of the present moment. However, to live fully and constantly in the moment, we must also master single-tasking and abandon multitasking. Research has found that only 2% of people can multitask effectively. Multitasking hinders people's ability to focus as they quickly switch from one thing to another. You can practice this with mundane daily tasks. For example, when you brush your teeth, Try to devote all of your time and attention to brushing your teeth without letting any other distracting thoughts creep into your mind. Besides reshaping our behavior to achieve growth, we also need to reshape our mind. Every person generates about 70,000 individual thoughts every day. These thoughts are often inspired by past experiences or are speculations and predictions of the future. Many thoughts can be self-deprecating. If we want to grow, we will need to purge all of these self-critical thoughts. We can begin this cleansing process by reframing our self-criticism. When you say to yourself, I'm bored, I'm slow, I can't do this, respond to yourself by saying, you are working on it. You are improving. Remind yourself that you are growing and you are making progress. Additionally, 
you can use positive direction to reconceive unwanted negativity, making your thoughts solution-oriented. The key is to remind yourself to take action instead of being disheartened. For example, change I can't do this to I can do this by. Instead of telling yourself, I'm unlovable, change it to, I'm reaching out to new people to make new connections. Reshaping the mind requires not only adjustments in language but also in behavior. An easy way to do this is to learn one new thing each day. This doesn't mean that you have to learn an advanced skill. Instead, you can listen to a book on Buki or learn about the culture of a city. This will give you something new to talk about with others. It could even be as simple as picking up on a new word that catches your imagination while you're chatting with friends. Sometimes the most effective way to reshape our minds is on a sheet of paper. It might be a good idea to jot down the thoughts that pass through your head when you feel uneasy. Writer Krista McRae has a phobia of flying. In order to reshape her mind, she started a blog all about her irrational fear. Then she found out that she was missing out on many things, like her grandmother before her, because of this phobia. She began listing all the things she wanted to do that were worth flying for. Although she didn't wholly overcome her apprehension about getting on an airplane, she definitely noticed an improvement. Writing down ideas alone won't help us solve all our problems, but it can give us a critical distance that may help us identify solutions and better ways forward. Our ego often fogs our awareness and seduces our minds with false impulses and illusions. Next, we'll examine how it affects our thinking and how we can re-establish equilibrium. Everyone conventionally wants to present a good public face. We usually strive for improvement. However, sometimes our ego can derail this process, causing us to adopt a false appearance. Sometimes, an innate desire to elevate our status leads us to be deceptive, judgmental, and even push away others we deem unworthy of our association. Focusing all our energy on creating a facade impedes our learning and stifles our growth. Excessive egos can be cured with humility. We should strive to bring to mind the bad things we have done to others along with the good things others have done for us. This makes us aware of our shortcomings and inspires remorse. It keeps us grounded. In addition, that we needed others' help will encourage us to feel humble. We can feel grateful that we received other people's attention and support. In the same process, we should try to forget and let go of the good things we have done for other people and dismiss any bad things others have done to our detriment. In this way, we will not become excessively attached to our good deeds, as this can otherwise lead to arrogance. It is good to learn to leave behind the harm that others have done to us and not dwell on it. Detachment is another practical way to deal with interpersonal conflicts. Shetty suggests that you look beyond the present and see all other people from a broader perspective. Think about whether they may be tired or in an ugly mood and perhaps how their behavior is improving. This is better than simply viewing another person's annoying behavior as directed unkindly towards you. When we step back from our emotive reactions and become objective observers, then we are not bound by an arrogant sense of personal accomplishment and can learn to be always grateful for the good things in our lives. If you have ever tried to present a falsely confident front, you'll find that feigning confidence takes no less effort than you would need to exert to gain real confidence. If that is the case, why don't we strive to achieve true self-confidence? Confidence doesn't only mean being who you want to be without caring what others think. It also implies being a better version of yourself, inspired and guided by others. Monks see their spiritual mentors and their saints as their arbiters of opinion. To follow this example would indicate that we should also pick those who support our emotional health, foster our growth, and share our values to give us feedback. Of course, feedback can also come from other channels. The key is to determine if advice and criticism can help us grow. The procedure of asking for others' opinions, evaluating their feedback, and then responding is an effective way to boost self-confidence. With that, we conclude the second part of this bouquet. We learned about how to reshape our life and give ourselves chances to learn and grow. More specifically, we learned how to find our dharma, live in the moment, reshape our minds, and build self-confidence. We've now finished the bouquet for Think Like a Monk. Having listened to the content of this book, 
we hope you feel inspired. Maybe you decide to make a start, change your routine and plan a new life from now on. Or, perhaps, when you wake up tomorrow, nothing will be different, and you will be the same. You may still oversleep, and your work might continue to be unfulfilling. Don't expect listening to a book to change everything. It's up to you. You choose your own path in life. If you keep this in mind, at least you will be ready to embrace change when your need becomes an imperative. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to gaining peace and achieving one's goals. We must focus on the present and stay on track regardless of life's twists and turns. At all times, it's essential to keep an open mind. When taking action, we may fail and fall, we may hesitate, and we may even act impetuously. Just remember that it is all normal. Try not to worry and just keep pushing forward. The mind of the monk is flexible as well as controlled, and always in the present moment. Let's think like a monk and extend our mental capacity as well. If you are interested, welcome Search Bookie and listen to the full audio instantly.